we looked at ways you can create an array by loading things off disk. But of course, actually, often what you just need to go and do is create a um, an array uh, from some sequence of um, uh, information you've got, such as a list. Um, and then you want to go and manipulate that. OK, so um, uh, just one other thing to say here is that um, the important thing about the when you're creating a list, of course, uh, creating a, an array, of course, is that you have to make sure that all the elements in that um, uh, list are uh, have a compatible or in the array have a compatible type. Um, and we'll see what happens when you try mixing types in just a second. Um, if you don't do that, if you have a um, uh, elements which have a different fundament, which can't be um, converted into the same uh, data type, then you end up with a, an array of generic Python objects, which is essentially not really much better than a list. Um, and so it's the thing you want to end up um, avoiding if you can possibly help it. OK, so the simplest way to, to make a, a numpy array in um, from an, a, a list of items is using the array function. So um, if you import numpy as np, then you can just do np.array, and then you give it uh, give that a, a list or some sequence of values, and it will turn it into an array um, like this. So in this case, we've created an array of integers by feeding it a set of five integers in the list. And if that list, instead of containing integers, contained floating point numbers, it would make an array of floating point numbers. Um, and we'll discuss in a second about, uh, I'll discuss a, a bit later on about um, how you can work out what the data type of each element is. Okay, um, and if you try creating what is a mixture of integers and floating point numbers, um, then NumPy tries to do the best it can. It says, well, all integers can also be floating point numbers, whereas floating point numbers can't be integers. So therefore, if you've mixed integers and floating point numbers in your list, you need to go and have an array of floating point numbers. Um, and even uh, it'll do that even if the actual data itself is all integer. So in this case here, the, the actual values are all integers. But because the last element in that list was 5.0, not 5, it said, ah, 5.0 is a floating point number, and therefore I need to make the entire array floating point numbers. Um, uh, and it's able to do this because it's able to go and work out that uh, an int can be represented as a floating point number. Um, if I tried adding a, a string into that list, then it wouldn't be able to do that because you can't uh, automatically guaranteed convert a string to a floating point number. OK, so that is sort of using the basic array function to go and create a, um, a set of values. But of course, um, if you want to go and create a, a sequence of numbers in some um, arithmetic order, it would be very painful to go and do that by hand like that. So NumPy offers us some functions that will create an array, um, a sequence of values. So the first one to introduce is the uh, A range. So a range is just like the Python function range um, that you might have used, say, for example, in a for loop. So you have a start value, a stop value, and a step. Um, and it basically generates the numbers starting from start, going up in steps, um, up to, but not including, stop. Um, so the a range works just like, like the range operator does. Um, then another alternative you've got is, um, Lin space, so Lin space or linearly spaced sequence. Again, that gives you a start and a stop. And in Lin space, you specify a number of points. Um, and um, as we can see in the example here, the um, the the stop now includes the is now included in that that list of values. So whereas a range is behaving like range, make it as similar as possible to range. Lin space is doing the the probably what's more intuitive and includes the end value as well as the start value. Um, and then in addition, we can have a logarithmically spaced um, uh, set of values. So in that case, you can specify a start and a stop and again, the number of points. So by default, um, it will use base 10 for its logarithmic space. So here we're going to have 
uh, 10 to the power zero, uh, 10 to the power one going up to 10 to the power 10 um, in increasing by a factor of 10 each time. Um, if, however, we specify a base, um, then we can control um, uh, the, the spacing and the log space. So in this case, I've specified base two. And so we're going from two to the power one up to two to the power 10 um, in sequence. So in other words, we double on each step up. Um, if you just want an array uh, full of constant values, then uh, there's a handy np.ones function, which will just create an array full of the value of one, and you just specify the number of points. Of course, you probably don't want um, to go and just have it containing values of one. Um, so if you want something else, you can just create the array np.ones, and then you just multiply it by whatever you want. So in this case, I'm multiplying it by the value of pi, and so I get a, a, an array of 10, 10 values, each of which is pi. Um, and so that enables you to make a very quick um, calculation, a very quick um, way of initializing an array with certain values. And you're relying here on the fact that you can do maths on an array and just write out an expression, and none people take care of uh, dealing with the fact that the, the one of the things you're multiplying there is an array of numbers, and it will multiply each element by the same value. Um, if you don't want ones, then there's a np.zeros function, which just creates an array full of zeros for you. Um, so that's all dealing with creating arrays um, uh, if you've just from scratch. If you want, if you've got one array and you want to create another array that's the same um, size, then there's a couple of useful functions. So there's np.ones like, and you say, here's an array, and it'll create a, a new array which has got the same uh, number of elements in it. Uh, and there's also a zeros like as well. Uh, you can also, of course, as well as creating one-dimensional arrays, you can um, create multi-dimensional arrays. Um, and you can do that um, either with uh, ones. Um, so rather than specifying just the number of elements, instead I give it a tuple um, of, in this case, two values, which is the rows and the columns. Um, and so just to you know, spot that you have actually got a double set of values because what I'm passing into the ones function is not a single integer or a sequence of integers, I'm passing it a tuple of values. And then um, things you can find out about your array. Um, so um, we're gonna start by creating uh, an array of um, some random numbers. Um, so I'm using um, here the numpy random uh, submodule, um, and I'm just going to create a, a set of um, uniformly distributed uh, integers um, uh, between one and ten, um, and I tell it with the size um, what size we want, and then the final bit, the dot as type, I'm telling it, okay, here's an array. Um, make sure that it turn it into an array of integers. Um, so if I had dot as type float, then it would be an array of floating book numbers. And in fact, you can use the dot as type to convert your arrays from integers to floating points or floating points to integers. Of course, if you go from floating points to integers, then you might lose information because if you had an element of say um, 4.2 somewhere in your array and you convert it to an integer, it'll get converted to four. Um, and you need to be careful of that conversion because um, just like what it does when you take a floating point number and uh, use int, so you do int bracket some floating point number, it doesn't round the data, it goes and just throws away the fractional part and as type int will do the same. However, in this case, that's fine. We're, we're, we're happy just to have the, the integers like that. Okay, so there are then various attributes um, about the array that we might want to care about. So um, first of all, you might want to know about the number of dimensions. So if the number of dimensions is zero, that means you've just got a simple scalar value. Uh, if the number of dimensions is one, it's a vector. Two is obviously a table. 
in NumPy, that's always specified as the number of rows by the number of columns. Uh, it, we call this row major, meaning that the uh, first index is the, is the row, and the second uh, index you give everything is the column. And then if you have dimensions of three, you get a stack of pages, and that goes as row um, stack of, of two dimensional arrays. It goes as a, a, a stack which is rows by columns by pages, meaning the two dimensional tables. Um, and you can have higher dimensional arrays, but they get increasingly difficult to, to actually visualize about what, what it's looking at. So um, uh, normally you want to be a little bit careful before you start making five or six dimensional arrays that you really do need that. Okay, so the number of dimensions you get is just from the endim attributes. You just do any array dot endim and tells you the number of dimensions. And then very closely related to the number of dimensions is going to be the shape of the array. So if it's a two dimensional array, the shape is the number of rows by the number of columns. So that you get with the dot shape attribute. So in this case, it told us that our um, array we'd created was five rows by 10 columns. Uh, you might also want to know um, the number of elements you've got um, across all the rows and all the columns, et cetera, and that you get from size. So again, in this case, my array dot size is 50 because that's five rows by 10 columns. Um, if you ask Python what the length of an array is by the len, then it tells you what the length of the first dimension is. So in other words, it'll tell you it's the number of rows, so five. Um, and that'll also become important when we want to start thinking about how you might iterate over arrays as well. Okay, since all the arrays in the, all the elements in the array have the same type, it's also useful to know what that actually is. And that's given by dot D type. And it'll return a value. Now, the actual thing it's returning there is not a basic Python type. It's a, a numpy, a special um, value, a numpy D type. Um, and you see here it says this is int 32. Now, this might surprise you because we created this as int. So why is it saying int 32 and not int? Um, and that comes down to the fact that um, the in NumPy, the, the size of each element has to be fixed, and NumPy has to know how big that element is. And specifically in Python, the int data type, you don't know how big it is in advance, because actually Python will work with arbitrarily big integers, and it will just use more memory as it needs to in order to store that bigger, uh, bigger and bigger integers. Whereas NumPy, because it needs to know how big each element is in order to work out how to get to the, say, the 10th element in your array, um, can't do that. It has to have a fixed size. So you get a, a label here that says, in this case, int32, meaning there are 32 bits of binary data to go and store that integer in. Um, and because it's uh, got to store positive and negative numbers, what it actually means is it can store um, uh, up to uh, two to the plus or minus two to the 31. Um, so uh, actually it's going to store um, uh, two to the power 31 minus one down to minus two to the power 31. Um, and that's to do with the fact the difference there is to do with the fact that zero um, is, a, is a value as well. Uh, and so it doesn't go completely symmetrically about zero. Um, so with floating point numbers, um, the number of bits is going to determine both the maximum size of the number, but also the precision. Um, so the way that floating point numbers are stored by the computer is you have a certain number of bits are used to go and store um, the uh, mantissa. So um, the um, if you think about how you'd write down a number in scientific notation, the bit before times 10 to the whatever, the, the 5.317, that's the mantissa. So you have a certain number of bits to store that, and then you have a certain number of bits to store the exponent. Um, so again, in scientific notation, that would be the times 10 to the minus 31, the minus 31 is the exponent. Now, actually what's going on internally is that the computer stories as a binary floating point number. Um, so the, uh, the mantissa is stored as a binary number. Um, the details of that um, are probably beyond the scope of computing too, but what you need to know is that the, um, 
the more bits you have to go and store a number in, then the more precise the number, but also the bigger the number or the smaller the number can be, the, the bigger the range. The normal one is going to store with 64 bits, and that generally is good enough for most purposes. Um, the usual sort of rule of thumb is that if you find yourself needing more precision than that, then there's possibly actually you're doing the wrong sums. Um, 